I wonder when we sing those old hymns, some of those words, does anybody know what fetter means? Okay, that could be, yeah. I just, it got me thinking about that and I was like, you know, a lot of those hymns were written back in the 1800s and different things and um, I wonder if they would even know what we're even talking about in today's language, right? And, and uh, as we don't know what some of their, their words that they wrote in those different times, but, but it's good that we have a God that, that works and uh, allows people to understand who he is in their own language. And today we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, kind of going through a little series of the book of Acts and what we can learn from the early church. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, we've got the coming of the Holy Spirit. And let's, let's just dig into it. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 2. I read out of the ESV version, so if you're following along in your phone app, um, you can change the translation there to make it easier for you if you need to. The book of Acts is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Romans. So that's where we'll be, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. I don't know if you noticed in that hymn, there was a, a verse in there that talked about the flaming tongues, right? So here we have, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So you have here that divided tongues is kind of a, I don't know what the right word is, not an analogy, but a, I can't think of what it was. I forgot it from my days of being in theology class. But uh, there's different ways that represent the Holy Spirit. What are some of the ways that you guys know of that represents the Holy Spirit? What are some of the symbols? What's that? Yeah, an advocate, right? A dove, right? And then we have the flames of fire, right? We have these symbols that represent kind of the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, fire represented the presence of God. His burning holiness, right? And is all consuming power. And so fire is kind of represented in that. And with these, it wasn't probably literally flames of fire, but it was flames, divided tongues of fire that appeared to be that way. And we, we know that the fire in the Old Testament is the presence of God, is burning holiness, consuming power. It's burning up impurities, right? And it's used. To represent that. We also see that the tongue, especially in the Old Testament, represented purity when you talked about the tongue or the power of speech that came with that. And so we have the Holy Spirit is coming down upon these all these disciples that were gathered together in one place in the sound of a mighty rushing wind came down, filled the entire room. And the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we have again the tongues which represented purity, but also the power of speech. And the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and allows them to speak in other tongues or other languages 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you really, you think about that. You know, here they are out in the Middle East. They're at that point where a lot of trade and all of this stuff is coming through. I know I shouldn't say the word stuff. My English teacher just popped into my head. But when Israel is positioned amongst trade routes, and these disciples are going to be spreading the gospel in these areas where there's high amounts of trade and people, and people are leaving on ships and trade going on ships, and, and everybody's going out, and the gospel is going to be able to be spread quickly. But here the Holy Spirit gives them the ability to speak in tongues or to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we're going to find out. Let's continue reading on here a little bit. And now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthenians and Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygra and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. So here you have the disciples and all of those that were in this room are now filled with the Holy Spirit and now they are speaking as the Spirit gives them utterance, sharing the Gospel in all of these people and all of these people from these different countries that I read are hearing the Gospel or whatever it was that the Holy Spirit was having them say. They were hearing it in their own language. This wasn't, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but these tongues, this language, the ability to speak in another language is the gift by the Holy Spirit given to these disciples so that the people may hear in their own language so that the gospel may be spread quickly. You think about, the, about these disciples and now they're going to be starting to be sent out and go into these different areas. And we're actually going to read a little bit later in, in Acts and, and throughout these chapters coming up that there were times where the Holy Spirit said, do not go to this country yet. And there were times where they were told not to go into certain places, but to go where the Spirit led them. But they needed this gift of being able to speak in tongues so that they could go, and when they spoke, people understood them. Even when they were, because in some of these areas, they were like meccas of economic, I, I don't even know what the right word is, but um, where everybody's hanging out, right? These economic metropolises and, and just areas of, Man, I can't even think. Somebody help me out here. I'm not going to be able to go on until I know what I'm trying to say. Like an economic, like what? Like everybody's hanging out. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Everybody's there though, right? And so you've got people from all these different countries just right here. They're hanging out in this area by the upper room where they were just filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you had 
Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, and all these other ones. And all these people are standing shoulder to shoulder and they're hearing the gospel in their own language because the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them the ability to do this. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want you to to realize that um, that this does not mean that this is the beginning of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is eternal. A lot of people, we've talked about this before, they think, well, Jesus only existed once He was born. It's not true. He's, he's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The same that the Holy Spirit, this was not just the beginning of the Spirit, but this was the new way and how the Spirit was going to work. Jesus told His disciples that when I die and when I rise again and when I ascend to heaven, don't fear because I'm going to send you a helper. And that helper is going to come and that Spirit of God is going to rest on you for those that believe. Also, we see that The Holy Spirit is coming to the people in a new and powerful way. God is reaching out to His people in a new way. If we go back throughout the the beginning, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through, we see God work with people in many different ways. With Adam and Eve, He was walking in the garden with them. With Abraham and some of those guys, God was verbally speaking to in directing them. And then we get to a period in the Old Testament where God kind of stops speaking to them, but He starts speaking through prophets. And these prophets are now bringing prophecy or they're bringing God's Word and messages to these people through prophets. Sometimes God worked through angels and dreams and visions and other ways like that. But He's coming now after Christ. Now God is coming with the Holy Spirit in a a new and powerful way. And this is the beginning of the new covenant with Jesus now until He returns. And so now God is going to work and talk to you and work in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. All of this took place so that the disciples could proclaim the mighty works of God and His holy presence to make Christ known. Do you realize that one of the things that the Holy Spirit is responsible for is to make Christ known? When I travel the country and I speak at a men's event or a wild game dinner and I give the gospel and, and people accept Christ, that's obviously not me doing it. That's the Holy Spirit already been working in their hearts and minds before they even come to that event. He's drawing people to Him and it's Him that makes it known, that it makes Christ known to them. That veil needs to be removed and only the power of God can remove that so people can enter into a relationship with Christ to make Christ known. These disciples, I'm sure, are like, just like, imagine this room. The Holy Spirit coming in, filling in, and you're seeing what appears to be like divided flames and tongues dancing on people's heads, and just everybody's being filled with the Spirit. Can you imagine the excitement and just the joy and the celebration of everything that was going on there? But little did they know that God 
empowering them like that, coming upon them, also meant that they were going on mission and they had some really tough things to do, but at least they had the, the courage or the encouragement that God was going to be with them. Uh, the source is unknown for this, but I found this little paragraph. It says, Power can be used in at least two ways. It can be unleashed or it can be harnessed. The energy in 10 gallons of gasoline, for instance, can be released explosively by dropping a lighted match into the can. How many of you guys ever thrown gasoline on a fire? Yeah, we survived, didn't we? How many of you guys have thrown gasoline on the fire and then you decided to get a match and then light it a few seconds later and it goes, right? I remember one time we were camping and this guy across from our camper, we're sitting in the camper and we're looking out the window watching him light this fire and he gets this can of something and he pours it on it and then he walks back in, gets his lighter and then he comes back and he lights it and it just explodes, and he's, you can tell him he's reeling back. His eyebrows were all singed, I would imagine. That's the power of gasoline, right? It's explosive. It can either be harnessed or it can be explosive. And it says it can be released explosively by dropping a lighted match into the can, or it can be channeled through the engine of a, a Datsun in a controlled burn, does anybody even, has anybody ever had a Datsun? Joe, you had a Datsun? What kind of Datsun do you have? Your whole life? Awesome. Do you still have it? Oh. <laughs> Joe, all right. I love you, Joe. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So the engine of a, a Chevy or a Ford in a controlled burn and used to transport a person 350 miles, right? Maybe 400 miles when it's harnessed inside that engine. Explosions are spectacular, but controlled burns have lasting effect, staying power. The Holy Spirit works both ways. At Pentecost, he exploded on the scene. His presence was like tongues of fire. Thousands were affected by one burst of God's power, but he also works through the church. The institution, God began to tap the Holy Spirit's power for the long haul. Through worship, fellowship, and service, Christians are provided with staying power. So think about that. The Holy Spirit came down upon these disciples and it was an explosion of God's power and they were to go out and make this happen, to grow God's kingdom and all of that. But Jesus also set up His church to have long-lasting power through worship, fellowship, edification of the saints, discipleship, evangelism, and he put the church in place, and God works sometimes in your life, sometimes in the church, sometimes in an explosive way, but sometimes he gives you the strength and the power to make it through the long haul. Sometimes, sometimes we're always wanting, I know this is my case sometimes, Sometimes I want the big explosion. I want the big impact moment, right? But then sometimes we forget about how God is working in our lives, equipping us, empowering us, and giving us the strength to make it through on a day-to-day -day basis. God works. The Holy Spirit works both ways. Since we're talking about the Holy Spirit, let's go into a little bit of theology here. 
and talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's role is for our lives, what He did in the early church, and what He continues to do. The first thing is the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We see in John 16, 8, says, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When I got ordained as a pastor, never thought I'd be a pastor, but when the Holy Spirit's worked through my life and positioned me for this, for my ordination, I had to write this big 25-page paper, and I had to go through all the different doctrines that are out there, and one of them is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so I had to research and discover all the things that the Holy Spirit does and what He's all about. And so here we see the first thing is that He convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The next thing that the Holy Spirit is responsible for is regeneration and indwelling within the believers. It's bringing spiritual new life to the believers. A regeneration, making your old become new permanently indwelling within the believer that accepts Christ, sealed with the Holy Spirit. John 3, 5-6, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians three sixteen. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you the spirit regenerates us dwells within us and really when we think about that with god's spirit dwelling within us should make us live a little bit different number three the holy spirit sanctifies and transforms believers We've talked about sanctification a lot, and that's the daily process of overcoming sin to become more like what God wants us to be, to become the person that God has created us to be, to put away sin, to repent from sin, and to turn and draw near to God. The Holy Spirit is part of that sanctification process. In the beginning, He convicts you of your sin. And if you respond to him, you ask for forgiveness, you confess your sins, he works in you and sanctifies you and works through that process. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it says, And we all are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's the sanctification, transformation. 1 Peter 1-2 According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. He sanctifies and transforms believers. Next, He empowers our service and our ability to witness. He empowers us to to be bold, to have a strong faith, to be able to lead with courage. The Holy Spirit works within us, gives us that power. We know that in uh, Timothy, the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy to fan in that flame and to have the power of God because God didn't give you a power that is meek and mild, and weak, but it's strong, and it's powerful. Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness. You will be my witnesses. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. 
1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, basically lists the various spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to his believers. Holy Spirit empowers you, equips you, and gives you the gifts that you need to accomplish the things that he's called you to do. Marlene's family, Josh, is going to France to be a missionary. They are equipped by God and by the Spirit to accomplish the things that they've been called to do. Yes, sometimes God uses his people to provide them those resources, but he's equipped them with exactly everything they need because God is omniscient, he's sovereign, in control of all things, and he doesn't put us in a path or a plan or in a situation that we're not prepared for. It doesn't mean that any situation we're in is always going to be easy. We know from the voice of the martyrs that sometimes being a missionary is very deadly. As we get farther in Acts and we read about some of these disciples who've been empowered by the Holy Spirit and are living and growing God's kingdom, it wasn't always a pat on the back. If it was a pat on the back, it usually was with a switch or some other Roman mechanism of tearing your flesh, beating you, throwing you in jail, doing all of these things, but the Holy Spirit gives you the strength and the power and equips you for every service and every witness opportunity that you have with somebody. My children always ask me, Lord, or Dad, I wish they called me Lord, that would have been awesome. But they just called me Dad. But they called me Dad and they're like, Dad, how, like, how do I know what to say? You know, if they're talking to a friend and I said, just speak from your heart and what comes out, God will make it work. I've told you guys stories before when I first was starting to speak at wild game dinners and different things like that. I didn't feel qualified. I was not ever planning on doing it. And sometimes some of my worst experiences or my worst presentations God used to have the biggest impact in those ministries. And so the Holy Spirit's going to work through you. So even if you stumble over your words, even if you maybe you said the right verse but you gave it the wrong reference or something, God can still use that. Just share the love of Christ and let the power of the Holy Spirit work through you and realize, just like I had to realize long ago, that it's not in my power that anybody gets saved. It's not in my power that this church grows. It's not in my power for any of this stuff. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and it's what God is either teaching us or allowing us to go through or what his plan is for our lives. Next, we see that the Holy Spirit leads and guides believers. He provides guidance in our decision making. But he's leading us according to God's will. We see in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit leads, guides believers. He also teaches us and reminds us. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to your remembrance all that I have said to you. When that thought pops into your head, 
and reminds you of the goodness of God or that you're maybe not going in the right direction. It's the Holy Spirit working you with you. He's the helper. The one that Jesus promised would come. Next we see that the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers. Romans 8, 26-27 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever had a time where you're by yourself and you were praying because maybe something in life was bringing you down? Or was so overwhelming, you didn't even know what to pray to God about. You were at a loss of words. You are struggling, maybe with your emotions or your attitude or, or something. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. And when we do not know what to pray, He is interceding, groaning, with too deep for words on our behalf, on our side, presenting us to God the Father. We also see the Holy Spirit seals and guarantees salvation. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14, it says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, we're sealed with the promise, promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. I know there's a lot of different views out there. Some people believe you can lose your salvation. I believe that when you make a true and genuine decision for Christ, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you are sealed... You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and it's a guarantee of your inheritance. And so with that, it doesn't mean that we continue to go on and sin and just live a, a party life. The Holy Spirit's going to convict you. The Holy Spirit's going to intercede for you. But the Holy Spirit also seals you that you are an adopted child of God. Ephesians, oh, I just read that. He's the guarantee of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit also gives spiritual wisdom and revelation. He illuminates our minds. He illuminates and gives us the comprehension to be able to understand spiritual truth. And He reveals the knowledge of God. Some of this stuff in, the, in God's Word, some of this Scripture, you probably wouldn't understand unless the Holy Spirit illuminated and gave you insight into that. He gives spiritual wisdom and revelation. 1 Corinthians 2, 10-12, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Lastly, the Holy Spirit brings unity to the body of Christ. He fosters unity within the church. He brings believers into one body of Christ. I know when we get to heaven, God is not going to be happy with the fact that we set up all these different denominations. And that we have a church on every street corner, blocks from each other. And they're worshiping over there, and we're worshiping over here, and they're worshiping over there. That's not how God, how Jesus set up his church to be. The Holy Spirit, Spirit brings us together, unity in the body of Christ. Just because we have a difference of an opinion, of an interpretation of something doesn't mean that we're still not on the same team, that we're still not worshiping the same God, and that we can't 
enter into a room like this and worship the same God, Savior, Lord of our life. But the Holy Spirit fosters unity. Ephesians chapter 4, 3 to 4, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit works in our lives in a lot of different ways. And I probably could take each one of these areas and turn it into a sermon. But I think you understand as we learn about the early church, there are some things we are probably doing wrong. There's probably some things we are doing right. But we're never going to do any of it right if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work through us and to guide and to direct us and to lead us to change us and to just trust in His power. We're going to see in the coming weeks, we're going to see what the power of the Holy Spirit did throughout these early disciples. The people that paved the way and set the foundation. Yes, it was explosive in the beginning, but it is set us on a trajectory for the long haul. The Bible is, to this day, the most popular book in the world. For thousands of years, Christ's church has grown and has been built and has survived. It doesn't happen without the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God holding it all together. You've heard me say before, the disciples, all of them, they died brutal deaths. If that was a lie, they would have gave in way before they, they died, right? The other saying is that Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or exactly who he said he was. All that the disciples did in the early church, all that Jesus did and said, would not stand the test of time if it was all just a group of guys. Hey, we got this really good prank. We're going to fool the entire world for the next 2,000 years plus. We're going to make up this story. We're going to pretend we're God and we're going to try to write this book. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't last. All that would be exposed so quickly. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, He builds His church. He works in our lives. And we're going to be seeing over the next few weeks some amazing things that the disciples did when the Holy Spirit was alive and present in their life. And what happened back then can happen today. It may look different. God may work differently in you and I than he did Peter, Paul, John, James, all of those guys. But man, we just need to trust the power of God. And he will do some amazing things. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Emily, Father, we thank you for sending us your helper, the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for working in our lives, convicting us, leading us, guiding us, directing us, illuminating your word to us, giving us the power of words to witness and to share the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside our fear. That when we're in a restaurant and a waitress wants to talk about what's going on in her life, give us the courage to say the right words 
but know that, man, we just have to just share the love of Christ and you will make it work. Lord, when we're in our workplace and we're talking to a co-worker and they bring up a question about, well, how could this happen? Or how could God allow this to happen? Lord, illuminate us. Give us the words to say that would honor you and would reveal the need for a Savior in that person's life. Lord, thank you for all that you do. Just continue to teach us and guide us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.